through 28. Listen for the word of God. Jesus and his disciples, they went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and he taught. They were astounded at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. The unclean spirit, convulsing and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed and kept on asking one another, what is this, a a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It is good to be with you, church, and it's an honor for me to share this message with you. Uh, Some of you may know that I made the transitions a a, a few years back from being a pastor to being a mental health counselor. I work out of an office in Parkville. Well, not really, because I work out of our upstairs old daughter's bedroom in front of a TV camera, and I have for much of the past year and a half. What a strange time we have been in. I'm not a fan of COVID. How about you? Would you like to cast it out? Go away, demon. Be done. My ministry at this point, my purpose, is to help people who suffer from various kinds of mental illness find hope and find healing. I've been trained as a pastoral counselor, which means for me first that I am a pastor and that I do counseling. Other pastoral counselors may not be pastors, but we're all aware of the importance the spiritual life has in people, how it's part of what drives us, what motivates us, what what concerns us, and we need to include the spiritual elements as well as the psychological elements in treatment. So as I like to say, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a soul doctor. This scripture from Corinthians discusses an issue that at first may seem to have nothing to do with us. Should we eat food sacrificed to idols or not? What? Where is the connection? It describes church members struggling with what some of them considered to be unclean food. Is it okay to eat this food if it has already been offered to an idol? If you went to the hamburger shop in Corinth, might you be getting a Zeus burger? The church asked Paul if this kind of meat was unclean or unkosher. Well, instead of arguing for one point or another, Paul takes a pastoral approach. He says that if his eating meat endangers someone's soul, he'll abstain from meat completely. Paul is not going to fight over something that for him is ultimately insignificant. There is no God but God. Idols don't really exist. It doesn't matter if you eat the meat offered to them. But what Paul wants to do is not hurt somebody else over something that to him is not really a big deal. He wants to not put up Walls. He wants to tear them down. 
if there's somebody who's trying to get to know Jesus, who wants to know Jesus and who wants to live a Christian life. Being right is less important than being kind. That's good advice for counselors, and it's good advice for all of us. Take this mask wearing, for instance. All kinds of debates. How helpful are the masks? How helpful is the shield? How helpful uh, is social distancing? We've heard different things at different times from the CDC and other places. What should we do? Well, for me, if by not wearing a mask, I'm going to hurt somebody's soul, keep them from coming into church because I won't protect myself and they think it's important that I do, then I'm going to wear the mask. We're not wearing the mask so much for ourselves as we are to, to show love to the people around us, to the weak, the vulnerable, the children, those who haven't been able to, or can't be vaccinated. Paul will give up his personal liberty to eat meat, to not cause somebody else to fall into sin. And that's a connection that I see that definitely relates to today. And then there's a scripture from Mark. Here we see Jesus struggling not with the, the food that may be unclean, but with unclean people. The Old Testament part of our scriptures was very, very clear. People or animals with certain deformities or abnormalities of behavior were considered unclean and to be avoided. Law was very, very strict. Crazy people, by the way, in this understanding, are dangerous. Stay away from them. They might be contagious. Unclean food. Unclean people. Unclean. When the scripture speaks of unclean, it is not talking about that which can be resolved with mask wearing and vaccinations and hand washing and disinfecting. Rather, it is talking about the spiritually unclean. That which is dangerous, frightening, and possibly even deadly. Not just now, but forever and ever. In Old Testament thinking, the best way to handle the unclean is just to stay as far away as one can. Don't let them in the temple. Well, Jesus changes just about everything in Jewish law, Jewish law with regard to cleanliness. Jesus doesn't shrink from those who are considered unclean. He embraces them. He speaks to the unclean spirits who inhabit the poor souls he meets. He speaks to their demons and he commands their demons to leave. Jesus is not afraid to get close. He's not afraid to confront evil. He is not afraid to tell evil where to go. Sometimes that is the most loving thing one can do. Jesus is not worried about getting infected or tainted. He has the power of God within him, and he is not afraid. Incidentally, you shouldn't always do what Jesus did. Or at least not in the same way. You and I are not Jesus. We were not called to give our lives for the sins of the world. We want to be like Jesus in as many ways as we can, but we're, we're not. We can catch diseases. Please love people. But please love them by following CDC guidelines like wearing masks, getting vaccinated if you can, and keeping appropriate social distance. I don't like these COVID restrictions more than anyone else. 
but I follow them to show love by not getting others sick. All right, we've talked about that demon COVID, which I think can belong in that category. And I truly hate it. But here you go. What do you think now of demon possession? We don't talk a lot about demon possession here, do we? Does it have any relevance to today? Maybe you're getting chills just imagining it? Some people believe that demon possession is real and that it happens. An evil spirit or multiple evil spirits take over a person's body and mind. They yell, they scream, they shout inappropriate, unprintable words. They display unusual body movements. They foam at the mouth. If you watch horror films, you've seen them make objects float, knives fly through the air. Demons are scary. In case you're interested, we're having a special viewing of The Exorcist after the service today downstairs. No, just, just, just kidding. Just kidding. The severely mentally ill were historically thought to be possessed by demons. The same was true for people with epilepsy, Parkinson's disease, MS, autism, and Alzheimer's. They were unclean. They weren't allowed in the temple. They weren't pure. They were all possessed by demons. They were dangerous. You might catch what they have. Stay away. Unclean. I think this history helps to explain the persistent stigma associated with mental illness. If you're crazy, you stay away from me and my family. If you behave in an unusual way, you are dangerous, or at least less than. If I have a mental illness, I am unclean in some way. I better not tell anybody. I, I better not even admit it to myself. This stigma leads to far too many souls avoiding counseling who might otherwise find healing and wholeness. The fact is that most mental illness looks fairly unspectacular from the outside. You can't readily tell if somebody has anxiety, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, PTSD, Complicated grief, paranoia, attention deficit disorder. You can't look at a person necessarily and tell that they have that. Folks with these problems look quite normal. In fact, it, it's estimated that about half of all people will have a mental illness that rises to the level of being diagnosable at least during once in their lifetime. Half of us will be upset enough at some point in our lives to get a diagnosis, even for only a little while. Approximately one in five adults in the US will experience mental illness in any given year. A lot of teenagers, a lot of children over the past year and a half have had mental illness that might never have had it without COVID. I don't remember, I don't know if you remember seeing that picture of a little five-year-old boy sitting in front of a computer and weeping. It's been a horrible year and a half. A child needs help. People with that mental illness look like you and me. They are you and me. Mental illness is very common, and it's a very big problem. Hug your kids a little more tightly. Well, maybe you're not so sure that demons possess people today. Maybe you're more of a scientific thinker. So if not from demon possession, what does modern science understand to be the causes of mental illness? 
genetics, for one. You do twin studies, separate the twins at birth. One twin has depression, it's likely the other one does. High likelihood of parents passing certain traits down to their children. The environment's another one. What we eat and breathe and drink and swim in can have effects on our mental health, not just our physical health. Diet and exercise for three. If we don't eat the right kinds of food, if we load down on too much sugar, it affects our mental health. I encourage so many of my clients who are sedentary to get up and just walk around, especially in a season like this that is so beautiful outdoors. Just walk around and notice the trees, the flowers, the bees, all part of God's world. All kinds of things can happen in life, regardless of all those, that... Uh, can cause our brain chemicals to get out of whack. Thankfully, there are good medications now that can help put your brain chemicals back in whack. Amazingly, good talk therapy can straighten out your brain chemicals and even change the shape of your brain. People with PTSD have a shrunken part of their brain, and when they receive good therapy to to heal their trauma, that part of the brain expands. and They can deal with uncomfortable emotions more easily. Medication and talk therapy together have significant healing power beyond the sum of the parts. These treatments are powerful. and They're a whole lot better than they used to be, even 20 years ago. But I want to get back to the scripture. I want to suggest that there's another significant cause of mental illness, and that's evil. Yeah, evil. Evil can cause mental illness. Maybe not demons per se, but, but evil. The evil actions of other people and ourselves can fuel a spark of mental illness or create one out of nothing. Let me give you some example of, uh, examples of the evil I'm talking about. Poverty. Poverty is a significant evil that fuels mental illness. When people lack basic nutrition, safety, education, health care, and employment, their risk of mental illness rises steeply. Add to that things like violence. When my clients tell me that they have trouble sleeping at night because there are gunshots all around the places they live in Baltimore City, can you not see how that would breed mental illness? There's human trafficking. War, terrorism, refugee status, corruption, and greed. All those things, you can understand why so many people in poverty end up with one or more forms of mental illness. And yes, it goes both ways. People with mental illness are much more likely to end up in poverty. And there you have the deadly cycle, poverty, mental illness, poverty, mental illness. The evils of abuse and neglect are others. If parents were just kind and protect their children, I'd have a lot fewer people in my counseling practice. Child abuse or neglect can bring forth a lifetime of mental illness, so can abuse of spouses and elders and vulnerable adults. Nobody has a right to treat people like toys to be played with or destroyed. That's evil. And it has consequences that ripple down through generations and out through communities. There's the evils of the isms. Racism, sexism, Cl uh, classism, ageism, 
sexualityism. You remember that Jesus hung out with everybody. He hung up, out with men, with women, with rich, with poor, young, old, sick, well. Folks who are victims of the isms are much more likely to be diagnosed with a mental illness and have a significantly higher suicide rate. Many victims of the isms end up victimizing others with different isms. Again, the cycle continues. Here's a quote that I think is true most of the time. Hurt people hurt people. And again, hurt people hurt people. Not always, but too much. And then there's there's the whole thing about individual responsibility. Sometimes we are our worst enemy. We're guilty, all of us, of not, guilt, of, of not doing what we're supposed to do and doing the things we're not supposed to do. Sometimes we make poor choices and forget about the consequences, and we get ourselves in trouble. Perhaps we spend more money than we have and experience anxiety and depression when it runs out. We choose unhealthy partners or friends. We get involved in illicit relationships. We don't parent properly with appropriate love and limits. We don't eat what we should. We don't go to the doctor. We don't exercise. We skip school. We stare at our screens for too long of a time. Our own evil actions can cause mental illness in ourselves as well as others. And then, you know, I'm going on about evil, but it's, it's a problem, and it's so related to mental illness, I, I need to speak of it. The last one is corporate evil. Evil done by those in power in our communities and world against those with less power. Here I think of Corrupt politicians, greedy business leaders, drug dealers, polluters, and terrorists, to name a few. Corporate evil also includes those who profit from the above, whether directly or indirectly. For example, if I find that a particular brand of clothing that I like is made in a sweatshop or with convict labor, I really shouldn't be wearing it. I really shouldn't be buying it. Because when I do so, I participate in that whole scheme. Is it impossible? Is it, it, to, is it impossible to avoid? Well, no. But we should try. Do something that supports someone's life to be in a better place. So this whole thing about evil, it's a huge contributor to mental illness, whether it wears horns or carries a pitchfork or not. Usually it shows itself in more subtle ways. It's just as dangerous. I thank God that I'm able to do my small part to help people heal from mental illness. But I'm only one person, and I'm a faulty, broken human being who's just trying his best and doesn't always get it right. I can't heal everyone. There are not enough counselors in the world, frankly, to heal everyone. And we need not to just to counsel people who have mental illness, but we need to prevent it. And that's where you and I in the church come along. The world needs me. The world needs you. The world needs our church. As a church, we need to be the kind of place where somebody who is different, somebody who has crazy thoughts, someone who is different politically from where we are, someone who doesn't wear the same kind of clothes, is just as welcome as everybody else. Jesus needs you to love and interact 
with the easy people to love as well as the hard people to love, to no longer treat them as unclean. Jesus needs you to speak about mental illness, even your own, as you're able to do it, to help reduce that stigma. And Jesus needs you and me to stand against evil, whether the evil is out in the world or it's the evil within our own souls. The good news is that we don't have to do it alone. We don't have to face the evil in the world ourselves. Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me. I'm gentle and kind of heart. I'd like to conclude by asking you the same questions that are asked of people when they join the United Methodist Church. When I ask the question, if you do, please say, I do. Here they are. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, answer, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, answer, I do. And then hear this blessing. May the God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit that you and all people may live in grace and peace and safety. We are still in that strange time of COVID where everything we knew has been turned upside down. And one of those is the joy of gathering at the altar to have communion together.